so it is kind of great to be here with a national organization of prosecutors who represent the future, who actually have a belief that we can change things and that we can do things in a way that is more than inframarginal, in a way that is more than incremental, that we don't need to wait 30 years after an idea is a good idea to act on it. Unfortunately, that's not what we, what we always see in government, and that's not what we always see in our local, and by local I mean statewide, prosecutors associations. In my various travels, I've gotten to know several of the uh, progressive prosecutors from some of the major jurisdictions, Kim Fox, Kim Og, George Gascon in San Francisco, many others. And what you hear from people who've been around for a little while is that to some extent within their own states, they are outliers. They are an outpost. They are trying to speak to the future and they're in a room full of prosecutors from usually rural jurisdictions who only want to talk about the past and do not see that way forward. Well, what I really want to talk about today is timing, and that is the reason for the title, Urgency of Now. For those of you who may not recall, at the beginning of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, given, of course, in front of the Washington Memorial, he said something that he said many other times, which is that there is a fierce urgency of now that tomorrow is today. He was far more articulate than I'll ever be, and I'm not going to read it word for word, but that is essentially what he said. You cannot wait. You cannot proceed at the pace that makes government and bureaucracy comfortable. Not moving now can be moving too late, and the consequences can be permanent. Why are we talking about this? Well, so strangely enough, Donald Trump, who spent the midterms appealing to people who have Confederate flag bumper stickers on their trucks in rural areas, decided now is the time for criminal justice reform, a few days after getting trounced in the midterms. Who knew? Sometimes these things can be explained as, as being Due to personal connections, yes, Jared Kushner's father was convicted by a person we all know of federal crimes. Yes, this is a bill that applies federally. But we, have seen, we are seeing this bizarre duality of a president who plays footsie with white supremacists, and then a few days later, when he himself is under criminal scrutiny from federal authorities, decides that now is the time for criminal justice reform. Some people might say this is a cynical effort on his part, having, frankly, waved a racist flag, talking about invading people in a caravan, describing innocent, harmless people as criminals. Some people might think that this is a cynical political move, which is understanding that his position is considerably weakened. Now he's going to claim that he is a friend to people of color. That as we all know, there is a discriminatory and racist systemic nature to the beast. And so now he's going to be opposed to that beast when his other tactics are not useful on a given day. I don't actually think much of that matters. I think what matters is that that is just one more of many signs that there is an opportunity. There is a timing that is crucial that we all need to recognize. Because those of us who are looking for a future for criminal justice, those of us who believe that the pressing civil rights issue of our time is criminal justice reform and is, among other things, the end of mass incarceration, need to take a look at this moment and this opportunity and this urgency of now. So Van Jones hangs out with Newt Gingrich. The Koch brothers keep coming around like kittens looking for milk. Go figure, what is going on? Well, I think one of the things that's going on is that there are people on the left who have a vision of criminal justice that has us not being the most incarcerated country in the world that is perhaps based on notions of equality and uh, a beloved society, something of that sort, 
But there are people on the right who I think at one point we would have called fiscal Republicans who have been talking in terms of cost and benefit for a very long time. They are fans of a free market. And what they see when they see mass incarceration is they see big government. In fact, they see way too big government. And they are absolutely right, because it is way too big government when you're spending so much money on incarceration that there are for sale signs on public school buildings in Philadelphia. And the class size of the public schools in Philadelphia, which are doing, frankly, not as well as they could, is about 35 for a given teacher. A hell of a lot more than when I came out of public school when I was looking at 22 in a well-funded public school system. So we have this moment when fiscal Republicans and people on the left both believe change is necessary. We have this moment when the most unpredictable and frankly menacing weather vane of a president of my lifetime is in favor of criminal justice reform and is able to do this even on the heels of a massive defeat in the midterms. He is able somehow to do this. What has he really done? I mean, honestly, not much. What this bill actually has done is it affects the approximately 7% of cases that are disposed of in the federal system, which leaves the other 93% to us. What this bill actually does in a backward-looking fashion is it seeks to rectify discrepancies between the treatment of crack and the treatment of cocaine in terms of the already excessive sentencing guidelines. This is a nice thing. However, there's been a fair amount of success in that realm already, and it's been going on for a very long time. What does it seek to do in a forward-looking way? Well, it seeks to give more discretion to judges over sentencing guidelines that were already advisory, but that's a good thing. And there are some other, there are some other aspects to it. They seem to finally be a little bit offended by the idea of life without parole for a third drug offense where there are not weapons involved. I mean, that is a good thing. So it does a few things within the narrow realm of federal prosecution. It makes things a little bit better. But again, I think more than anything, what it represents is that even in the politics of Donald Trump's America, he feels a reason to move on these issues. One aspect of being a public defender or having worked in a system, like at least like the system in Philadelphia for a very long time, as if you have been a public defender or you have been on the defense side or you have been a plaintiff civil rights attorney, you have gone through 30 years, in my case, of beatdowns. Not that I didn't win, I actually won a lot. But you have often been the second most despised person in the room when you came in the room and said that sentence is too long or those civil rights apply. You have often been someone who was subjected to a gauntlet in which in many instances, you had a prosecutorial entity that told the judges what to do. And no matter how integrous those judges were, there was tremendous pressure on those judges to do what that prosecutorial entity wanted, or it would turn to the press. And it would use the press as its propaganda arm to tell the kinds of stories that they're comfortable telling. Individual stories about individual and terrible crimes that got us to the following. For 30 years, Americans have been polled and they have been asked, is crime going up or is crime going down? 65% of them for 30 years have said it is going up when it was for 30 years going down. You want to talk about how you get bad policies? Try this. Have an entire electorate living in a fantasy world, a fantasy world generated by politicians and a press with whom they had a symbiotic relationship whose actual motivations were ambition, personal self-promotion, incumbency, and the sale of media, the sale of, I guess at the moment, it would be clicks, rather than the motivations that citizens and voters actually expect, which are motivations to seek justice. This all sounds a little gloomy first thing in the morning, I understand, and um, you are welcome to you are welcome to have more coffee as you endure this gloom. But there is a point to it, I promise. And there is a little bit of, of sunshine that will come out from behind the clouds in a moment. So that's where we are. 
we find ourselves sometimes, especially as elected officials, we find ourselves in a position where every political operative is telling us, don't do it. Don't do it so quickly. Not now. Don't do it. Well, they are all 100% completely wrong. And they are wrong for moral reasons, but they're also wrong for political reasons. Because the reality is that voters are sick of inframarginal change. And voters are sick of a government that moves at an unacceptably slow pace. They are looking for change. This can have its dangerous side, as in our current presidency, but it can also have its incredibly fruitful and helpful side. I would not have gotten elected if it were not for the fact that voters in Philadelphia recognized and went way past the politics of identity, recognized that their position on the future of criminal justice reform looked nothing like the way the system itself operated and looked nothing like what the system itself thought made sense in terms of a future. So, we find ourselves in a time when there's some bipartisan support for criminal justice reform. Amazingly enough, we find a guy playing footsie with white supremacists who wants to do some criminal justice reform, even if it's not the biggest thing in the world. So what are we afraid of? What is slowing us down? How do we get there? We all know that prosecutors, perhaps more than any elected official, any elected official, have the power to unilaterally do certain things. Uh, Dan Satterberg spoke to my attorneys yesterday, and he said something, a lot of things that were very interesting, but one of the very interesting things he said was that the reason the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program was, was formulated the way it was, and this of course is a pre-arrest diversion program primarily directed at people who are suffering from addiction, also people in you know, a related situation such as sex workers. The reason he did it that way is he really didn't want to go to the legislature or the courts for their buy-in because it wouldn't get done. So he did it directly with police who bought in. Well, that is a reflection of the reality that when we make a decision to bring a case or not, to charge a case a certain way or not, to divert a case or not, when we do that, we have the power to do that unilaterally. We do not have to do what a member of the U.S. House of Representatives has to do, which is I will trade my good idea for your pork barrel, and I will compromise on X so you can give me Y. We don't have to do that. We actually have the ability to do what Dr. King was talking about, to act on this urgency of now. So let me talk to you about the situation of Pennsylvania, and let me talk to you a little bit about statewide prosecutors associations and how we might want to think about them. So the situation in Pennsylvania, which undoubtedly views itself as a somewhat uh, snobby northeastern state, or perhaps some of you think of it in those terms, is pretty alarming. The reality is that while the country has gone to a 500 percent level of increase in incarceration, Pennsylvania has succeeded in an 800 percent increase over the last 40 years. During almost all of that time, there has been a statewide organization, which is the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association. It represents a pro uh, about 66 counties, not exactly. Every single member right now, every single member in 2018 is white. 80 to 85% of them are men. Um, the women who are in there, some of whom I know rather well, are of an extremely conservative bent, frankly, from what I've seen, no less conservative than the men involved. And that organization has represented itself as speaking with a singular voice in the legislature for all that time. They are the ones, not the only ones, but they are the ones who got us an 800% level of increase in incarceration. Pennsylvania had the most juvenile lifers in the country, which means it had the most juvenile lifers in the world. Many of those, lifers were, many of those juvenile lifers were sentenced to death before the U.S. Supreme Court said unconstitutional, and then they were sentenced to life without the possibility of parole before the U.S. Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. Pennsylvania succeeded in having more juveniles doing life than any place in the world. And that happened during the period of time that the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association presumed to speak with a singular voice to the legislature. 
We are, only, we are one of only four states where you can be a person who is involved in a robbery, you never touch the gun, someone dies during that robbery, and you're going to do life without any possibility of parole. There are only four states that do that. Once again, who was there? The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, which, by the way, used to run out of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office and was created by a, Phil by a Philadelphia District Attorney. It does not run out of the Philadelphia DA's office anymore, and we will talk about that in a moment. Pennsylvania has the fifth largest death row in the United States. You know, a lot of Northeastern snobs want to make jokes about Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana and Texas. Not so much. So how do we get here? Well, Pennsylvania, I think very much like California, faces what may be the most immediate divide in this country, which is the divide between urban and suburban areas on the one hand and rural areas on the other hand. You should know that I am from Missouri. I am not from Philadelphia. My mother's people were farmers in the St. Charles, Troy, Missouri area, all of them, hunters, all of them. I have no beef with people who are from a rural background. That is where I used to go as a kid for Thanksgiving. But there is a real divide, and it is exactly the divide that our president tried to cynically exploit, although it kind of backfired on him because it turns out the suburban people don't feel quite the same way. There is a real divide. That divide is not just something that was whipped up. That divide is real. And let me talk to you about it in terms of how Pennsylvania incarcerates people. So there are many state prisons in Pennsylvania. There are none in Philadelphia County. And as those of you who are probably familiar with John Pfaff's PFAFF, John Pfaff, John Pfaff's work locked in, may have noted, you have three different aspects to why it is that rural counties, which produce state legislators who write state laws, like incarceration. The first is they don't have coal and steel anymore. They need industry. Having a prison that employs a lot of people helps to maintain your economy, even if it's public. And we don't have a whole lot of private prison activity in Pennsylvania, but it helps to maintain your economy. That part's simple. How about this part? The United States Census counts an individual who was born in Philadelphia and lived in Philadelphia until the minute that person was sent to jail in Center County. They count that person in a jail cell as being a resident of Center County. There are 13,000 of these people from Philadelphia, approximately, in state prisons all over. Who cares? Well, I'll tell you who cares. Government funders care. Highway funders care because this is based in many, many instances on population. So if Center County can get highway funds for a person sitting in a jail cell from Philadelphia who's never going to drive a car because they're in a jail cell, and if they did drive a car, they'd go back to Philly. If Center County can do that, that's not hurting them with their highways. What about gerrymandering? Nobody does gerrymandering better than our conservative brothers. What about that? Well, if you can import Philadelphians, put them in a cage, and say, we got another voter, sort of, here. You might be in a jail cell and not vote, but we got another voter. It gives you power. So we're talking straight up money. We're talking government money. And we're talking governmental power. We have a motivated bunch of rural counties, motivated who want to have our Philadelphians, often black and brown Philadelphians, in their jails. Because it gives them power and it gives them money. Speaking of gerrymandering, guess how the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association votes? Imagine the U.S. Senate without the U.S. House, where Vermont gets just as many votes as Philadelphia. Philadelphia County is the most important criminal justice jurisdiction, at least in terms of the uh, amount of crime and the amount of individuals who are sent into custody. It represents 27% of the people who are in state custody, and it has its own county system, which it has a declining population, but at one point looked like 10,000 people. It now looks like about 4,960 people. So it kind of matters what happens in Philadelphia. But if you give Philadelphia one vote and you give Center County one vote, 
then obviously this entire system with over 60 counties is going to skew away from Pittsburgh, which is a major jurisdiction, skew away from Philadelphia. It's going to place power in the hands, even within the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association, it's going to place power in their hands that we don't recognize as being appropriate in terms of our federal democracy. That is one of the things that goes on with the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association. The membership of that organization is 30% Philadelphian because it includes assistant district attorneys, assistant attorneys general. 30% of their membership is Philly. And what have they been doing? Well, I know this is not an isolated situation because I have spoken to my progressive prosecutor buddies from other cities, but what they have been doing is being the voice of the past. They have not only defended the terrible record of their policies being the problem that got Pennsylvania to where it is, they are doubling down to do it again, much like Jeff Sessions was doubling down on a brand new war on drugs. They are doubling down on a brand new war on drugs. You want some specifics? Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association aggressively supported House Bill 741, which would restore many mandatory minimum sentences in Pennsylvania. They're currently out because they were written in violation of a lien, and therefore most of our mandatories went away a few years ago but they'd like to restore them. This legislation, needless to say, would tie the hands of both DAs and judges to do what we pay judges to do, which is to make individual judgments that arrive at individual justice in individual cases. It has been reported this would cost the state at least $80 million in the first year and $200 million a year after that. Needless to say, it would also drive up our mass incarceration. 800% is not enough. That is the position of an organization in which until very recently the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office was a member. We are no longer members of that organization. They have opposed our governor's longstanding moratorium on the death penalty and they did so disregarding a bipartisan report which laid out multiple deep flaws in how the death penalty is applied in Pennsylvania and they opposed the basic reforms that would fix some of those flaws. The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association came out in favor of all juvenile lifers receiving a sentence of a minimum of 35 years to life upon resentencing regardless of prison adjustment or length of sentence. Once again, an effort to take away discretion, but more to the point, a complete and utter violation of what the United States Supreme Court, through the mouth of a conservative court, said was required which was to recognize the difference between children and adults, to recognize that they have a greater capacity for rehabilitation and not to simply focus on the initial crime, but to focus on the adjustment and the changes that have occurred. I guess the US Supreme Court doesn't even apply when it comes to the Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association. They opposed Senate Bill 293, which would have allowed defendants convicted of felony murder, meaning our second degree murder, the one I was speaking of in terms of a robbery gone wrong, that would disallow the, the possibility of parole. This legislation would have finally addressed the issues of automatic life without parole sentences in the context, not of a first degree, but of a second degree murder. As I mentioned before, we are one of only four states that went down this road, and they opposed that change. They have opposed what should be completely non-controversial reforms designed to prevent the conviction of innocent people, they have opposed recording witness and defendant interviews and confessions. They have opposed easier access to DNA. Who wants the truth, right? They are now doubling down on the war on drugs. They want to increase the offense gravity score for fentanyl and they even want to do it in situations where the reality is many people who are uh, either using or selling white powder that they consider to be opioids don't know whether they have heroin or they have fentanyl. Nevertheless, it turns out the answer to this crisis is not to have our president screw down on the supply of pills, which has increased 400% in the last 10 years. It is not to stop our president from doing what he just did, which is to approve a form of opioid 10 times stronger than fentanyl. It's not that. 
The way to do this is that incredibly successful war on drugs that we started 30 some years ago, that everybody who's open-minded recognizes has been a complete failure. It has simply furthered the stigmatization of people who suffer from a mental disorder, which is called addiction. The drugs are the symptom. They don't cause the crime. They are the symptom. They are the symptom of trauma. They are a symptom of genetic predisposition. This is a medical issue. And yet we have a Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association which presumes to speak with one voice, no longer mine, that would have you believe that the war on drugs all over again is a good idea for their own incumbent incumbency, for their own ambition, for the economies of their own counties. They've even been down on legalization of marijuana, which has become an incredible engine for public schools all over the country. Kills no one, unlike brown liquor, which I guarantee you, every one of my, no, maybe not everyone, almost every one of my Pennsylvania district attorney colleagues drinks in the evening. They're not even okay with that. So they are, in fact, the voice of the past. And if I sound a little indignant, I am. The reason I am a little indignant is that for the past 10 and a half months, they have been representing that with the Philadelphia District Attorneys Association as a member, in fact, with the Philadelphia District, Attorney, with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, excuse me, as 30% of their membership, we're all on the same page. That is what they have been doing. They have been wrapping the legitimacy of the decisions voters made in this particular jurisdiction, our efforts to connect to a future in not an incremental, but in a serious way, they have been claiming that Philadelphia supports this absolute nonsense, this throwback set of policies, and we do not. I look forward to a time when progressive prosecutors can work effectively in their statewide district attorneys associations, and I know that in some states you can. All of this is actually very much a local thing. But I need to make sure, at least here, and I hope you will make sure where you are, that the experience of having been the idealistic outsider, the experience of being David, does not slow you down when you become Goliath. Because we are all, those of us who seek a future that looks like criminal justice reform, we are all becoming the Goliath. We are taking over in elections in the major jurisdictions all across the country. And what this means for now is that in Pennsylvania, when legislators go to consider what they're going to do, there's a couple things that they're going to think about. Well, it looks like President Trump, when he's not cheering on Confederate flag-wearing folks, looks like he likes criminal justice reform. It looks like maybe the suburbs are hanging with the cities, and needless to say, both of those areas are more affected by crime than many of the rural areas, and there are exceptions, I understand that. It looks like some of these wins, let's just talk about, for example, Wesley Bell in St. Louis County. Wesley was supposed to lose. He was supposed to win. He couldn't even get labor support with the exception of maybe one union. Everybody was shaking their head. He won by 13 points, and he did so against a 26-year incumbent who was completely embedded with the kind of police force we saw in Ferguson. Things are changing. We are becoming the Goliath. We are at a point where we cannot afford to let our experience as people who've been trying to change things incrementally, because that's the best we could do, slow us down. There is, simply put, a fierce urgency of now that we move forward. As an organization, this is a great way to connect to people who may have found themselves in statewide organizations isolated or patronized, who may have thought, well, if I hang in here long enough, some of these people will listen to me some. And yeah, they will. It may be that the best thing in your particular jurisdiction is to hang in there with that organization. I look forward to a day when I could rejoin that organization. But the reality is, what I feel in Pennsylvania now is a fierce urgency of now that says no. The Pennsylvania District Attorneys Association will not claim the legitimacy 
of its most important criminal justice jurisdiction in trying to take us back 40 years? No. And therefore, we have made a decision to separate from that. I know that you will all face other decisions, dramatic and mundane, and I know that you will make the right decisions, but I would just ask you to take away one thing from you. Please don't forget the phrase, the urgency of now. Thank you.